Hello everyone, my name is Mariana Carrillo Gonzalez. I'm a postdoc at Imperial College London, and I'm broadly interested in high energy theory and cosmology. Today I'm going to tell you about complementary constraints on inelastic dark matter, which is a work I've been doing with Natalia Toro, and the paper will come out on archive soon. As we all know, there's a lot of evidence to show that dark matter exists, meaning there is an extra component that behaves just like matter, but has very weak interactions with our the visible sector, aka with the standard model. Given this, there have been a lot of searches, either by looking at the CMB and isotropies, by looking at accelerator probes, or for example, the direct detection, trying to find what is exactly the origin of the dark matter. And unfortunately, we have found nothing. So it is very interesting to still try to figure out and look at every possible corner of what dark matter could be. Here, I'm going to take the approach of assuming dark matter, it's a particle. And I'm going to show you what a simple model can give you and that it could give rise to interesting direct detection signatures and it can relax some strong CMB constraints that standard WIMP models already have. So let me start by showing you what the inelastic vector portal log matter is, which is the model that I'll be talking about. To start with, let's look at the simplest technically natural scenario of a dark matter particle, which is just a Dirac fermion, here the noted bad guy. Here the Dirac fermion interacts with a U1 gauge field, this A prime, and furthermore, this A prime has a kinetic mixing with the hypercharged field strength. But after electronic symmetry breaking, this kinetic mixing now will be with the photon, and there's going to be a parameter which we call the kinetic mixing parameter, epsilon. Now, this means that our dark matter chi now can interact with U1, and U1 could also interact with any um, matter in the standard model that has interactions with the photon, but now with the same strength multiplied by an epsilon. This simple model actually has been ruled out in a large parameter space by CMB observations. But there is a thing that we, one can immediately notice here. There is no symmetry that forgives that there are Majorana masses. So we can add simply these Majorana masses corresponding to these two Majorana fermions cones. And if we assume that these are much smaller than the Dirac mass, we will obtain these nearly degenerate mass eigenstates with a mass splitting delta, as you can see over here. Furthermore, we're also going to assume that the mass of the gauge boson, Ma prime, is larger than the mass of the dark matter. This is so we don't run into problems of underproduction of dark matter, even that the main um, channel for annihilation in the opposite case will be the case of chi chi to A prime A prime. So in this scenario, we're going to see more specifically what are the interactions that we have for these um, mass eigenstates. So we have the light and the heavy ones, and there's going to be an inelastic interaction here that is going to be of order alpha dark which is just um, the following definition, just in analogy with QED. Now we can see that this will be of a vertex of order one simply because this, as we said, is smaller than M chi, so this is simply of order one. On the other hand, we also have elastic interactions between, for example, the heavy and heavy states or the light and light states. But these are suppressed, as you can see here. Again, this is subdominant, so there is a suppression of this term that's ordered the mass splitting over the M, mass M chi. For the rest of the stock, I'm going to assume that this is just exactly zero, so we don't have these interactions at all. So we can just forget about the elastic part for most of the part. But I'll also come back and talk about what happens if this is not exactly zero and we actually have these extra elastic interactions, which in generically will be further suppressed because they're not only suppressed by the mass splitting, but there will also be P-way suppressor. We have a velocity suppression for them. So there will be a part of our parameter space where this could become relevant, and I'll just mention a little bit about it. But in general, we have now different kinds of interactions. They are inelastic, and this largely changes the thermal history of dark matter. So now let's examine in detail what is the thermal history in this case. To start with, the total abundance of dark matter will freeze out as the usual way, it will follow first just its thermal equilibrium distribution, 
And at some point, when the Hubble rate and the rate of interactions is the same, they, they, would have, they would freeze out. And for this freeze out, um, then the total number of dark matter would not change. But one should notice in this case that there's still going to be some other interactions between the heavy and light state. So the abundance between two states could change. But first, let's analyze this first result over here. In this case, we can compute the total dark matter annihilation cross-section, as you can see it here. And this is simply the heavy to light state annihilation to, to fermions or to hadrons. And depends on all the parameters that are shown over here. But this can be fixed given that we know we want that the total dark matter abundance is the one that we observe today. So if we fix this to be the relic abundance that we want, we can fix what our parameter our kinetic mixing is, our epsilon square, and we reduce our parameter space for a thermal target. So for the whole talk, this epsilon square is going to be fixed for this thermal target. Then we can analyze the second phase out, for example, over here, where there will be other scatterings or collisions of the heavy and light states that can further deplete the heavy state. For example, there will be scatterings of the heavy state with electron to the light state and electrons, or the heavy heavy to light light. Both of these will further deplete the heavy state. And as you can see here, it should go like the pseudo equilibrium abundance for a while and then freeze out again. And this has a Boltzmann factor that goes like e to the minus delta, the mass splitting over the temperature of the dark matter. So here I'm showing you two plots that you can see how the depletion goes depending on the mass of the dark matter particle. Starting here to, with one GV and here one MeV. So we see that for light masses, for example, for this scattering, there would be a further depletion in this case in the red plot where this is a large mass splitting. But if the mass splitting is very small, we basically have the same result as if you only had elastic interactions. On the other hand, for this case, we see that the depletion is very large. Here, the scale in the y-axis is different, it's logarithmic. So we have a further depletion that's very strong for small masses. In fact, we can see that in our parameter space, where here we have in the mass of the dark matter on the y-axis and in the x-axis the mass splitting, in most of our parameter space, what dominates is this collision, the heavy, heavy to light, light. And this is going to be the process that mostly depletes our state. So in our analysis, we're going to assume that there's only two freeze out. And the second freeze out is the one that, um, given by the process that mostly dominates, meaning that depletes the protest, your um, abundance of heavy state. So as you can see here, most of our parameter space is dominated by this process, but also at heavy masses, we have that the scattering with electrons dominates. But we don't only have collisions, we could also have decays. And these decays um, are allowed when the mass splitting is larger. For example, here, when it's a order of the mass of the electron, indeed, the heavy state can decay to light and two electrons. And this has a strong effect in high depletion of the excited state. Similarly, for this small corner here of a parameter space of small masses and large mass splittings, we can have that there's a decay from the heavy state to light and three gammas, three photons. And this process again will deplete heavily our excited state. So it's important to know in your whole parameter space what are the dominant processes and how much they can deplete. And as I mentioned, in general here, I'm neglecting what would be the elastic scatterings, but if we were to include them, it's important to note that there could be a semi-elastic process in this purple triangular region over here, where the semi-elastic process could further deplete our abundance. So maybe in this region, our results could change if these processes are present. Now let's look at the right side. Here I'm simply showing what would be the, abundant, the relative abundance of the excited state with respect to the total abundance. And again, you can see that in the regions where we have the decays dominating, this is completely depleted. And here, instead, it goes like m chi to the seven halves. So it, again, goes the case very fast as the dark matter becomes lighter and lighter, as you can see in this plot. So we can see a high suppression of the excited state, mostly at small masses. 
now, once we know the thermal history, we can finally understand what constraints could arise in this model. But let me go first to primordial constraints. So these primordial constraints come from looking at CMB and isotropies, given that we can still have, after freeze-out, some residual annihilations and residual decays. These residual annihilations and decays can impart some power on the intergalactic medium and could change the cosmic reionization history. Thus, by looking at CMB, we can find that there are constraints on the power annihilated. And this can be measured by the following quantities of the power annihilated or the power from the decays. And one can see explicitly that they depend on the cosmic history and they depend on the abundance of the excited state very strongly, both of them. So if you don't compute this correctly, then you can find different kind of constraints. So once we constrain both of these quantities, we can find that there's some set of parameter space that is not allowed and is basically ruled out by the CMB. Here, this one is basically ruled out by annihilations and this one by decays. Further on the right, we, if you remember on the previous plot, we had a strong case, so we don't have many constraints on this region because basically the abundance of the heavy state is fully depleted. And furthermore, by looking at um, exact analytic, um, well, not really exact, at approximate analytic expressions, we can see that um, there's a special um, relation between the mass and the delta, the mass splitting that shows where the constraint in the bound is. For example, if you go back here and remember that this was m chi to the seven halves over delta, here you will see that including this m chi, this turns into this bound over here. So it's basically dominated by how you have um, your abundance. And this abundance is again dominated also by your total abundance of their matter and also the cross sections on the relevant area, which if you remember is the cross section for the heavy, heavy to light, light, light state. And also I'll be showing over here where will be the region where the semi-elastic scattering can um, be relevant by this striated region. So let me now move on to a different set of constraints, which is a decelerated based dark matter production. And this decelerated based dark matter production um, basically has no dependence on the relative abundance of light of the heavy state chi H. So this is completely different than what we had before from the CMB. In this case, what I'm showing here is um, a plot of epsilon square or kinetic mixing that, as I, as I said at the beginning, is just fixed. Um, so it gives uh, the right abundance for their matter. So this is our thermal target here. And everything that is above in these color regions will be constrained by the following experiments. So here at large masses, it's dominated by collider constraints and small masses by fixed target constraints. So the important thing to see here is that while it really it doesn't cover a big region for our benchmark of an alpha dark of 0.5 and an MA prime equal to 3 M chi, we can see that still there's some prospects, for example, from Bell and LDMX, most importantly, that will cover a whole region of the sub GED space. Another important thing is that if we have a large mass splitting, actually this is actually ruled out in this region for small masses. So let me move on to the final um, constraint that I'm gonna analyze very quickly, which is just direct detection. In this case, we have three different regions in our parameter space. One of them is where the upscattering from a light to heavy state is allowed, is kinematically allowed. Then there's a region where only downscattering is allowed and we see that it will be heavily dependent on the abundance. And as you remember, the abundance is heavily depleted for small masses. But furthermore, there's a region where the decays dominate. So there's abundance of the heavy state is heavily depleted and only loops where there's a scattering of the light light state will be relevant. So let me now look into more detail, but now at the downscattering signal, which is the most novel phenomenology, although it could also be the mostly model dependent one. So a quick analysis shows you that the monoenergetic, the recall energy is actually monoenergetic for these cases. And it goes like the reduced mass of the chi and the nuclei that you're scattering from over the mass of the nuclei times the kinetic splitting, as long as our, kinetic, our, our mass splitting is larger than 
uh, this kinetic energy, which will always be in for parameter space. Then we can compute our expected rate in the usual way by taking into account always the detector efficiency and the particle physics input where we have the cross section and a form factor in the case of nuclear recalls. And also we will take into account um, the air shadowing, meaning depending on the wind of a dark matter and how the dark matter particles approach our detector, they could down scatter before they even reach the detector. So we also take that factor into account here. And of course, the cosmology will also be important and depending on the abundance of our dark matter, we will get a higher or smaller decay rate. Here, our cross-section in general will look the following way. And we can analyze two cases. One is nuclear recalls and the other one is electron recalls. In the first case, for nuclear recalls, we will see that if the mass of the dark matter is smaller than the mass of the nuclei, which will be the case um, in certain regions for the cases that we are analyzing, we will have a recall energy of the following form. In those cases, if you simply simplify this expression over here, you'll see that the cross section grows with the mass of the dark matter. So at small masses, then this cross section will be smaller and the rate will be smaller. So the nuclear recalls are actually not easy to see at low dark matter masses. But then you have a complementary uh, observation, which is looking at electron recalls. In this case, instead of having all these ends here, you, you, we refer to electrons. And this is interesting because now the uh, recall energy will simply be like a order of the mass splitting, given that we expect the, the mass of the dark matter to be larger than the mass of the electron. And the cross section in this case now doesn't have a, a dependence, well, or a heavy dependence on the dark matter mass. That means that when we go to small masses, our rate is not going to be as suppressed as in the nuclear recall case, which is very good for us. And we'll see that we can obtain strong constraints for our model. So let me now move on to show you why exactly we're calling these complementary constraints in a plot that shows all the constraints I've been talking about together. Again, for this benchmark model over here. So first we have in yellow, the CMB constraints that I already showed you previously. And for example, the decays are good in this region where the decays are strong, but they're still um, not a heavily depleted heavy state. And here is the standard annihilation case. Now we also have uh, the upscattering, which is relevant in this region where it is um, kinematically allowed. And it could further extend here if we can use heavier and heavier nuclei. But it already covers a region that is not covered by CMB. Now accelerator probes in blue clearly are not very relevant, but they don't depend on the cosmology. So even if the heavy state is heavily depleted, they can still give constraints, for example, in this region over here. Now for direct detection, we have the nuclear recalls over here from the CREST experiment that has a calcium, oxygen, and tungsten target. So below this line of um, 10 GeVs around here, these approximations that I was talking before in this region are valid. And we can see indeed that um, this is complementary to, again, to CMB, to accelerator probes, to upscattering. It just completely probes a different region over here. Furthermore, we can see that the Xenon experiment can also probe a completely different region because this one is the only one relevant for sub GME masses, which is over here. So this is very interesting. This is only for electron recalls. And maybe looking at this picture, you can think, OK, this is very constrained. But let me just quickly mention that this is not, is not exactly the case. Because if you look at exactly what is the exclusion factor for this part, for example, for a delta mass splitting of 3 kV, and of course, I'm choosing this one specifically because this model could be um, an explanation of the scene on one t-axis, we see that the exclusion factors can be of order one in a lot of the parameter space. So it's not heavily constrained. So small changes to cosmology or inclusion of semi-elastic scatterings could change a lot of things. And to end, let me just tell you that um, we have a lot of projections. The CMB is cosmic variance limited, so it's not going to improve much. But we also have accelerator probes that will improve heavily over here in this region and some direct detection probes too. 
So I hope you found this talk interesting. If you have any further questions, I hope we can meet in the discussion. Thank you.